Well, welcome to Alfalfa Livestream Series, sponsored by Alflorex Seeds. I'm your host, Corey Geiger, editor of Hordes Dairyman and a member of the editorial team that also publishes the Hay and Forge Grower Magazine. We are broadcasting from our Cheese Cave, our studio in downtown Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, at the historic W.D. Horde and Sons building commissioned by Wisconsin Governor W.D. Horde and the founder of Hordes Dairyman. W.D. Horde was also a pioneer in alfalfa, and it's one, and it's the main reason that the Hordes Dairyman Farm is on the National Register of Historic Places by the United States Department of Interior. There was a lot of research uh, done there on alfalfa, and uh, certainly become an important part of the Wisconsin uh, forage for dairy cows. I look forward to serving as host for this monthly four-part webcast sponsored by Alflorex Seeds. Today's presentation will focus on alfalfa variety selection. All of our presenters will be welcoming questions from our viewers during the second half of this hour-long webcast. To ask a question, use the GoToMeeting platform, that's the control panel there, and type a question into the panel. And I encourage you, as you hear a speaker, go ahead and type those questions. My colleagues here in Fort Atkinson will sort through those and will ask our group of six guests to help answer those later on. But, but now I'd like to welcome Ron Cornish, General Manager of Elflorex Seeds. Elflorex Seeds and their partners provide ruminant and animal farmers with commercial hay and commercial hay growers with agronomic support, education, and alfalfa varieties for today's alfalfa growers. Thanks for joining us, Ron. Hey, thank you, Corey. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, Alfrex Seeds Alfalfa Livestream Webinar Series. Uh, we want to thank you for your commitment for continuous improvement to, to help you increase your productivity on your farm or for your customers' farms. Alfred Seeds is very proud to have a network of over 300 dealers across the U.S. representing our brand. And we know there are a lot of choices out there when it comes to um, making uh, a purchasing decision for um, seed purchases. Alfred Seeds feels our focus on alfalfa and other forages sets us apart from many of them. Uh, you know, it's kind of right there in our name. Uh, Alforex stands for Al Alfalfa and Forage Excellence. And we pride ourselves on being a leader in variety development. Uh, our connection to our parent company, uh, Corteva AgriSciences, uh, really helps this. Uh, they have one of the world's largest breeding programs in alfalfa today. So Alfrex is excited to kick off the first of four alfalfa live stream webinars today. And we hope that you find this uh, webinar on variety selection informative and that you're able to take uh, some key points away uh, from the information shared here today to help you make your variety selections for the coming year. Thanks everybody and Corey, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you, Ron. I'd like to welcome our next presenter and he can turn his webcam on, that's Dr. Don Miller. Don is currently the Director of Product Development for Aflorex Seeds and is based out of Napa, Idaho, certainly a great dairy state Don, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on all things alfalfa. Welcome to Alfalfa Livestream, Don. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here today, and hopefully we'll give you some information on how to pick them, uh, alfalfa variety selection. Uh, you know, as we uh, look at uh, picking an alfalfa variety, I, I th thought it was interesting to go back and look at the history of alfalfa variety development and, and some of the criteria that was used in the past of picking an alfalfa variety for a farmer's uh, production, forage production. Um, alfalfa was not native to North America. It came out of the Middle East. And so all the alfalfa that uh, was planted in North America came from the immigrants and the seed they brought with them. And one of the first ones that we ever heard about was uh, Grimm alfalfa. Wendell Grimm was an immigrant from Germany. He brought alfalfa seed with him and he settled uh, around the, the Great Lakes area of the US and he planted his alfalfa and, and it survived the winters uh, of that uh, environment. And uh, for that reason, uh, a lot of the area farmers uh, wanted grim uh, alfalfa seed and, and Wendell uh, produced some seed of that and it became very popular because of its ability to survive the winter. Now, after uh, Grimm was uh, released uh, or being available to farmers, uh, they soon realized that winter survival wasn't the whole, whole story. Uh, 
there were other things that limited alfalfa production and and diseases were one of those and so uh, the public institutions the universities started uh, looking at how they could improve alfalfa and, and one of the first things they looked at was bacterial wilt uh, that was a disease that damaged the root system so the the variety ranger was released and then later on vernal was released and and a whole series of public varieties were released over time and again uh, most of those early varieties came from uh, uh, the public institutions and and they were trying to uh, develop varieties that uh, give a little bit more production and survived a little bit better uh, in that environment so over time there's been a significant uh, variety improvements in alfalfa and, and a lot of those improvements were uh, uh, really concentrate on insects and disease and many of the insects uh, that we we have today we didn't have when uh, ranger and vernal were uh, released uh, spotted alfalfa aphid uh, didn't occur in north america until the 1950s and first showed up in new mexico and, and they figured it came in on an airplane from the middle east uh, that landed in a uh, uh, Air Force Base uh, in Roswell, New Mexico. So again, uh, a lot of different things and improvements over time. Uh, blue alfalfa aphid we didn't have until the 1970s. Verticillium wilt was a European alfalfa disease, and then we started seeing it <coughs> in the U.S. in the 1970s. So <coughs> over time, uh, there's been a lot of improvements on disease and pest resistance in alfalfa. But if you look down to the bottom of this list, there's also uh, some significant improvements for other traits that were important in alfalfa production, uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa, uh, varieties that had improved fiber digestion. Again, things that uh, really uh, made a difference in, in the profitability of the alfalfa that was being grown across the US. And like I said, there's been a tremendous amount of work being done on alfalfa. All the early work uh, you know, in uh, the 1960s and before that, were mainly from the public institutions. But in the 70s and 1980s, we started seeing uh, private industry uh, get involved. And then there was just a, a really uh, large uh, input of alfalfa uh, breeding uh, done and a lot of varieties being uh, developed over time for uh, various uh, improvements. You can see here uh, across from the 1960s to 2021, uh, there's been around 2,595 varieties uh, uh, released uh, uh, across uh, across the U.S. Now, not all those varieties are are still uh, being marketed today, but there is a an annual list that comes out. You can see here on the right this alfalfa variety ratings, uh, 2021. Uh, currently, there's about 178 alfalfa varieties that are being marketed across the U.S. So, there's a lot of uh, choices out there for the growers to look at, and for a whole range of improvements in alfalfa. And this is really a, a pretty good photograph that really shows you how how far we've come and the continual improvements of alfalfa varieties, the increased performance uh, with all these improvements. You can see here in the center, uh, Vernal, which was released in 1954, uh, really not doing well in this trial here, but you can see a, a variety on the right uh, that was released in 2003 is outperforming the Vernal, and then even a newer variety on the left that, that was released in 2006 that variety is yielding about 11 tons per acre more than what the vernal uh, 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 yielding in that, in that trial. So again, uh, lots of improvement in alfalfa over time. And really, unless you see them side by side, uh, it's really hard to realize how much uh, we've come and how far we've come in improving alfalfa varieties. Now let, let's get down to one of the first factors that I consider important in selecting a, an alfalfa variety for your farm. Just like when uh, Wendell, Wendell Grimm released his uh, variety, uh, winter survival is an important thing. You need a variety that's gonna survive in the area that you're gonna grow it. Now, like I said earlier, alfalfa originally came from the Middle East and that uh, early alfalfa was uh, adapted to warm climates, but as it was spread uh, around the world, it was planted in environments that uh, had very cold climates, and those alfalfas adapted to uh, growing in those areas. And we found that uh, alfalfa could react to day length and temperature, and so those uh, varieties that could react to that uh, survived in those cold climates. They they started shutting down as the day started getting shorter and the temperature started getting colder as a means of uh, saving their root reserves going into the winter months. And so 
uh, alfalfa breeders uh, took that information to heart and and they broke all the alfalfa varieties uh, that around the world into uh, originally uh, nine do different dormancy classes. Now we actually have 10 dormancy classes, uh, rating every variety on a scale of one to 10. Uh, a fall dormancy rating of one meant that variety was adapted to cold climates. A, a fall dormancy of 10 meant that variety was adapted to warm climates. And you can see on this US map here how uh, uh, different uh, varieties were uh, used for different parts of the country. Now, the interesting thing about that fall dormancy rating, that's the only rating we had for a bunch of years to uh, predict where a variety should be planted. But we know that as you increase uh, from a fall dormancy one to a fall dormancy 10, there is an increased yield potential. And in the early years in the upper Midwest, we would plant twos, threes, and maybe four fall dormancies. But we we're always looking at how can we increase uh, yield. And sometimes we'd, we'd try to push the envelope a little bit we knew that uh, a fall dormancy three out yielded a two. We knew that a fall dormancy four out yielded a three and so on. But how far up could you go on that fall dormancy scale without getting winter kill? And so for years and years, we only had that fall dormancy rating and every so often we'd push the envelope on the yield going to a higher dormancy and we might get some winter kill. Well, eventually alfalfa breeders decided that we needed a second scale uh, a winter survival rating uh, to go along with that fall dormancy. And so that having that second uh, uh, winter survival rating really gave us uh, a lot of uh, uh, more assurance that any variety that we would plant, uh, if it had a winter survival rating of around that two or lower, uh, we had a pretty good uh, confidence that that variety was gonna survive the winter. And so we could push that yield envelope uh, a little bit more. And, and now we see in the upper Midwest, we even see farmers using a fall dormancy five as long as it, uh, that variety has a, a winter survival rating of a two. And so again, uh, using those two ratings in, in tandem really helps us uh, push that uh, yield envelope and, and have some assurance that uh, we're not gonna have a, a, a lot of winter kill, as long as we're in that winter survival rating of a two or lower. Thank you, Don. Let's go to a poll question in here and see what our viewers are thinking. The poll question is going to read like this, select one answer. What is the most important criteria you look for when selecting an alfalfa variety? Yield and quality, persistence and disease resistance, biotechnology traits, price, or other? So go ahead and answer that poll question here. And uh, I know a number of you watch this on a computer screen, then you can uh, vote. But if you're listening in a uh, as a podcast with your phone, then you won't be able to vote. So we're going to go ahead. We are at the 50% mark. We're going to close it in about five seconds. So go ahead and make your vote. And uh, Kristen, let's take a look at those results. So there they are, Don. They're on the screen, and you can see yield and quality topped pretty easily here at 77%. What are you thinking, Don? Well, I think uh, yield is always... Uh, um a big criteria in an alfalfa variety. And, and that uh, is something that the alfalfa breeders are really striving for. But there are a lot of things out there that detract from yield. Uh, if you don't have proper uh, disease resistance, uh, that can really uh, subtract from the, the potential yield you're gonna get. So my second criteria of selecting an alfalfa variety is making sure that you know what uh, diseases, insects or diseases limit the production in your region. You know, not, you go across the U.S., it might be different in different parts of the country, but knowing what is the, the major limiting factor in your area as far as the disease and insect is a pretty important criteria on selecting a variety for your location. Now, if you determine, uh, say, Phytophthora root rot is a, a big uh, factor in your area or Phanomyces, you want to select a variety that has at least an R or an HR uh, as far as level of resistance to that, uh, that pathogen. So, again, uh, Pick uh, whatever your limiting factors are and get a variety that has at least an R or an HR uh, as far as level of resistance. Now, like I said earlier, depending on where you are uh, in the country, uh, if you're in the Midwest, uh, potato leaf hopper might be a, an important criteria in selecting a variety or uh, even uh, phantomyces. Uh, again, if you have a cold, wet uh, spring, uh, this is a pathogen that can really affect uh, seed emergence. 
Uh, so there's a, a race one of phantom ICs, race two. And so if that uh, has been an issue in the past in your region, uh, sure enough, you want to get a variety that has an R or an HR uh, for the, that pathogen or, or a, you know, resistance to the potato leafhopper. Now, if we're in other parts of the country, like the Western US, uh, the criteria may uh, change. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, stem nematode is a major limiting factor of raising alfalfa. And also in the West, uh, a lot of times uh, the aphids, the blue alfalfa aphid, spotted aphid, uh, different uh, aphids uh, across the US can be a problem. And also in the Western United States, uh, salinity tolerance can be uh, uh, an important factor in selecting a variety. So again, Find out what limits production in your area and use that as part of the criteria in selecting an alfalfa variety. Now, you know, besides insect diseases, uh, winter survival, uh, you know, your polls show that yield is an important factor, forage quality is an important factor, but there are other things that uh, alfalfa breeders have been doing to improve uh, uh, the profitability or uh, the what we would say is the good points for an alfalfa variety. Harvest flexibility, there's varieties now that you can delay harvest a few days and still uh, have maintain good forage quality. Varieties for different soil types, uh, if you have poor water drainage, grazing type varieties, irrigated uh, dry land, insect resistance, disease resistance. Again, there's a lot of different things out there that uh, might be uh, important to you. Uh, are you gonna raise a pure stand of alfalfa or a grass alfalfa mix? Uh, weed control, uh, do you want Roundup Ready Alfalfa? Again, uh, depending on your uh, needs, there are a lot of choices out there. And so pick the alfalfa variety that fits your needs. Well, thank you, Don. We have another poll question here and our producer will put that up on the screen. Again, asking for audience participation here. What is your primary source of information when making an alfalfa variety selection? Select one of the following, seed company representative, university or extension specialist, local seed dealer or crop advisor, the internet or other. So go ahead and answer that poll question. And we're gonna get some additional insight from two additional guests here, uh, Drew Heise and Mitch Sundoff. So while our viewers are voting here, they can go ahead and turn their webcams and audio on so we're ready for that. And uh, the results are coming in here. We got about 65% vote and we got a couple of leading choices here. So I'm gonna ask Kristen to go ahead and cut that poll off and we'll see the results. And we'll see 32% uh, is seed company representative, local seed dealer or crop advisors, 37%. And the other ones, are uh, the university extension is coming in, uh, in third. So we can take that poll down and invite our guests here and those are definitely interesting results. I'd like to invite Drew Heise and Mitch Sadoff to Alfalfa Livestream for a panel discussion here about what is important in their regions when it comes to variety selection. We're gonna start with Drew, who's president of Bovine Supply Plus. What are alfalfa growers, dairymen and dairy women, looking for in their alfalfa varieties in upstate New York, Drew? Yeah. In upstate New York, we, uh, we deal with a lot of different elevations here and microclimates with our water and many soils. So the first thing people are evaluating is sort of uh, like uh, Dr. Miller talked about is the dormancy that they require for, for their area, which varies quite a bit. And uh, we also look at our winter survival rates as people are trying to get the bigger yield on a lot of uh, a lot of their fields as we're limited with land trying to push these dairies to larger and larger sizes so those are two big uh, concerns there along with the quality and uh, there's a couple ways people address quality here it's with low lignin alfalfa and or maybe putting grasses in their alfalfa mixes in order to gain quality there so those are some things that we talk about at the farm level and try to find out what fits for them. Well, thank you. Thank you, Drew. I know uh, that part of New York State certainly gets blessed with a lot of snow off the uh, Great Lakes there. I see you got your Buffalo Bills flag and they're having a great season. It's been a little while, so happy for you in that regard. Uh, before we go to Mitch here, I wanna remind our audience that you can go ahead and type in questions as this uh, discussion continues and we will have the second half of our presentation do some Q&A and Drew and Mitch will be part of that. So you can go to the GoToWebinar control panel and type those in and our production team 
we'll see those questions. Now let's turn to Mitch Sudoff, who is seed advisor with Birch Seed Company. What are growers looking for in your area? And you're based in Ohio and Indiana, another uh, great dairy area, but you also have a number of uh, livestock producers there as well. So Mitch, what are you seeing? So when we go and we start considering what varieties we're going to pick, we'll typically interact with our customers and have that conversation to try to understand what's the end use and what's the expectation. For obviously for dairies, you know, we're going to want the high yield with high tons, but they're probably going to put a little bit more focus on silage or digestibility, where Drew kind of mentioned the low lignin alfalfa. Or when you talk about guys that are mainly selling alfalfa to the alfalfa mills, their main focus is going to be on high yield. Um, harvest management, having that conversation to understand how guys are going to be aggressive on making their cuttings, or are they going to be a little bit more laxed? You know, do we have to extend that harvestability window? Here in Ohio, we've had a few years where we've had some really crazy weather, and a polar vortex rolls in. We go from 34 degrees to negative 34 degrees in one 24 hour period. So winter survival is probably something we're focusing in a little bit more on. Uh, cost of seed, the dairy industry has kind of been struggling for a little while here. They've had their ups, they've had their downs. It's been an interesting year. And kind of reflecting back on one of Don's slides, you know, some of the hybrid alfalfas, they're not gonna be the most, they're not gonna be the cheapest alfalfa you're gonna, acquire across the industry, but the value that they're going to bring back as far as their additional yield and additional tons and having that conversation and explaining to guys their initial investment in the alfalfa and what they can expect to see. So those are a few things that we try to focus in around here and back to you, Corey. Thank you, Mitch. And I, I think this leads into what Don's going to talk about next here, but certainly uh, for Hordes Dairyman, one of the things I focus on a lot, uh, we divide things up by subject area, but on genetics. And when you buy a unit of bull semen to breed your cow, you're making a long-term investment. You're not just making a calf, you're changing your herd over time. And in, in many ways, alfalfa variety selection is like that. It's a perennial crop, crop excuse me, and it, you can get it multiple seasons. That's a lot different than corn, wheat, or soybeans. So Don, talk a little bit more about that. Well, I think, Corey, you just sort of led me into my slide here. Um, you know, I think a lot of times uh, farmers go out and they look at uh, the cost of the alfalfa seed, and sometimes there's some sticker shock. But uh, like you mentioned, I, I think it's important to realize that unlike corn or grain, alfalfa is a multi-year crop. And, and you buy that seed, and then uh, you get uh, three to four years of, of, of yield off that. And so you can spread that seed cost uh, across that time period, and you're not having to buy seed every year. And so that does make uh, alfalfa a little bit more affordable. So, and you know, I, I think what Drew and Mitch said uh, uh, really rings true that, uh, you know, you have to uh, get a variety that's gonna make you some profit. So I always say, don't limit your profit potential for the next three to five years by planting an inferior low cost or what I call a low profit alfalfa variety. You know, you really, uh, no matter how much you, uh, fertilize a poor variety or, or how well you manage it, it's really hard to uh, overcome that inferior genetics and, and you're gonna have to live with it the next three or four years. And so uh, with that in mind, I, I, we have a, a video here that we're gonna show that uh, really uh, uh, a farmer in the back east uh, actually took this to heart and he took uh, uh, what he called an economy uh, blend uh, and, uh, and a premium alfalfa and planted those side by side on his farm. And it really illustrates that whole point of uh, you sort of get what you pay for. And uh, really in the end, uh, a variety pays for itself. I was recently asked to troubleshoot a field that was split between a premium alfalfa variety and an economy blend. I soon realized that this side-by-side -side planning was a prime example of why low-cost economy blend is not a good investment despite its lower cost. This scenario of economic blend versus a premium variety was captured with video, photos, and data that we can discuss later on. Here's some of the background information on the fields. Both products were pre-inoculated raw seed. No seed treatments were involved. The field was drilled using the same equipment on the same day in August of 2019. 
The crop history of this field was wheat, bean, corn, winter squash, and finally planted to alfalfa. Crop protection products and fertilizer program were the same across the field. No discernible differences were observed in the previous crops, and the soil was uniform all the way across the field. The only difference this time was that the field was split between a premium alfalfa variety and what was sold as an economy blend. The grower observed differences as soon as the crop emerged. The premium alfalfa emerged quickly and was very uniform. The stand was thick. The economy blend was inconsistent in emergence, far less vigorous, and the resulting stand was thin. Weeds also established more quickly in the thin stand of the alfalfa uh, economy blend. On April 27, 2020, the stand of both plantings were evaluated using Alpharex seed stand count ring. Three random counts were taken from both the premium alfalfa variety and the economy blend. The premium alfalfa resulted in stand counts of 172, 161, and 165 stems in a two foot square area. If we divide that by two, we ended up with 86, 80, and 82 stems per square foot respectively giving an average of 83 stems per square foot. When an alfalfa stand has greater than 55 stems per square foot, the yield potential of the stand is considered 100%. We also took stand evaluations in the economy blend, and that resulted in stand counts of 88, 78, and 42 stems in a two foot square area. Again, if we divide that by two, we ended up with 44, 39, and 21 stems per square foot with an average of 34 stems per square foot. That makes the yield potential of this economy brand only 60%, and that's going into the first year of production. Well, I think that really uh, illustrates the point of, you know, the differences uh, with some of these newer alfalfas, they really do pay for themselves, uh, uh, you know, good stands and, and less problems compared to the economy. Now, you know, Mitch and Drew uh, mentioned, you know, some of the good traits that they they need in an alfalfa variety. I think with all the breeding that's being done uh, recent in the recent years, improved forage quality has been one of the things that has come to the top of the list. Um, you know, this added value of, of an alfalfa variety with better forage quality, whether you, you talk a high gest, a harvex, or a hybrid alfalfa, again, they might cost more, but uh, at the end of the day, they do uh, provide some added value to that uh, that uh, variety. Now, beyond uh, forage quality, uh, I think if you put a pencil to it, it really doesn't take much more uh, improvement in yield uh, that a lot of these varieties, new varieties have. Uh, even a, a little more yield, a quarter to a half a ton per acre pays for that additional seed cost of that better variety and, and usually that occurs during the first year. So again, uh, don't be scared of that initial sticker shock. Uh, these varieties do uh, bring added value and for the most part, they, they will pay for themselves uh, in either better forage quality, uh, better persistence in the field or a better yield. Well, thank you, Don. Ne now it's my pleasure to welcome Kevin Jarek to Alfalfa Livestream, sponsored by Alfalorex Seeds. Kevin serves as a crops and soils agent in Outagamie County for the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. Kevin, I look forward to learning your thoughts on alfalfa from the heart of Wisconsin's seven county area in northeast portion of the state that has over 100 cows, dairy cows per square mile. They're eating a lot of alfalfa. Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Corey. Thank you to Hordes Dairymen as well as Alpharex Seeds for inviting me to participate today. When we take a look at uh, alfalfa and the methods that uh, we've used to establish that in the past, I think it's easy to uh, make the comparison that alfalfa genetics have made the same type of leap that we see in equipment. Today, what I want to do is I took the opportunity to talk to farmers, agronomists, seed dealers, agricultural professionals in Wisconsin, and get their thoughts about the most important characteristics we value up here in the northeast part of the state. What you're seeing is a chart depicting the dry matter 
for alfalfa yields that were tracked in Northeast Wisconsin here, as well as statewide. This is the Wisconsin Alfalfa Yield and Persistence Program. This was established by Team Forage under the leadership of Mike Rankin, UW, former UW Extension uh, Crops and Soils Agent from Fond du Lac County. And what this, this was put together so that we could track what's actually happening out in the field. What are we seeing for on-farm data? And as you can see, you could take any part of the United States and, and do the same thing. You would want to establish what are we actually seeing for yields? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We had two years, 2007, 2010, where we averaged better than five tons of dry matter. We also had two years, 2009 and 2013, where we couldn't eke out more than four tons. When you look at uh, the study as a whole from 2007 to 2019, we had an average yield of approximately 4.42 tons of dry matter. Again, this represents Wisconsin. Your yields will, will vary, but it provides context because the number one characteristic that was identified by the diverse group of people I, I talked to was yield is still the most important. Now, sharing what I just did, what we'd ideally like to see here is a nice bell curve. But unfortunately, we can see the tallest bar here representing fields that yielded less than three tons of dry matter is on that far, far side. So unfortunately, We've had some adverse conditions here in Wisconsin uh, recently for the past two, three growing seasons. And because of that, we've emptied out our inventories, alfalfa fields were lost. We have 1.25 million cows in the state of Wisconsin, and we typically have 1.25 million acres of alfalfa. Works out pretty neat, one acre per cow, but unfortunately, uh, at least the alfalfa numbers have dropped due to winter kill, and that has impacted what comes in as our number two criteria for alfalfa selection. It's winter hardiness. Typically, prior to the past couple of years events, it was quality. Now it's winter hardiness. And I think a picture's worth a thousand words, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one. These are some unhappy alfalfa fields. We received record re precipitation. And again, when you look at the heavy clay soils that that alfalfa is trying to uh, survive in, winter, winter hardiness and survival has been challenged. At the end of the day, the best ability is availability. When farmers put that seed in the ground, they establish that new stand and the following spring, that hay isn't there. It's, it's very disappointing. What you're seeing here is that earlier this year in January, I went out to alfalfa fields here in Wisconsin, dug under the snow cover, and unfortunately, it isn't the alfalfa's fault, it's the curveball Mother Nature's been throwing us. These plants never went fully dormant, and we can pretty much figure out what that means as far as yield characteristics and uh, survival moving forward. It's not just the growing conditions that Mother Nature's been uh, tough with, because of the weather, we've had things happen here in Northeast Wisconsin that I've never seen during my entire life in agriculture or my time uh, working as an educator for almost a quarter century. What you see is alfalfa being raked in preparation for harvest as, as haylage, and that's in November of 2019. Um, you know, we've got some buffalo uh, representation as far as football and I think the idea is that it's always snowy in Buffalo year-round while well, some might think the same with Lambeau Field in Wisconsin I can assure you that middle picture of hay being bailed is not June it's December 2019 so again it's not just the things we put put on the field as far as mother nature what practices had to be implemented to get the feed out of the field Let's go back to happier times. This is a typical May, third, fourth week in Wisconsin. You can have the window down, you can smell the fresh cut alfalfa, you can stop at farms, talk to producers, even though they don't have time to talk, they're happy to see you because we see in the right slide there, we're putting up high quality feed. And quality, even though it's no longer number two in the short term, it is still very, very high. I'd, I'd even call them number 2A and 2B, but let's move forward with uh, quality. The Forage Councils play an important role because we know that as that as the temperature is warm, that alfalfa begins to stretch out. Here you can see it at 22 inches. We track the maturity. Is it in the vegetative stage, the bud stage? Hopefully we don't reach flower stage. And those councils help us with harvest decisions. 
while you saw a peak stick, the data that you're seeing here, it's very important to note. This is not an endorsement or criticism of any of the alfalfa products identified here. As an advisor to the Forage Council, farmers said, Kevin, can we look at and compare some of these alfalfas? They purchased the seed. This is what they were going to use. We just set up the trials. So we're looking at alfalfa starting the first week of May, second week, third week, fourth week. Let's focus in on the third and fourth. You can see in the third week, we, we have two alfalfas being com compared, a newer alfalfa variety versus a more traditional conventional one. And you can see the differences there as far as the RFQ. It is important to note, this is wet chemistry. So these are not uh, um, NIR estimates. Next slide, please. Here we have another site. And we can see as far as this location is concerned, the first one was on the west side of the county. This is on the east side. The west was lighter soils. This was heavier clay soils. And the trend is the same. Typically the third week, by time we're looking at May 24th, uh, one week later, May 31st, we hope to have that alfalfa out of the field. And here you can see by comparing these two alfalfa varieties, there was an observable difference between the quality. And I think what we're looking at here is when you select seed genetics, it's nice to know that there's the possibility of having an insurance. Mother nature may not cooperate with you, but if we can't harvest till the fourth week, that quality doesn't fall off a cliff. The trend in cutting dates in alfalfa, again, data from the Wisconsin Alfalfa Yield Persistence Project, if we start with 2013, you can see we had a trend of June 10, June 4, June 3rd. Yes, we had three years in a row with May, but that 2019 date was June as well as 2020. So the graphs I showed you earlier are important because we simply aren't getting alfalfa out of the field as quick as we used to. Farmers are great to work with because they'll make observations that you're rushing trying to cut height at the same uh, for everything, all these other protocols. And the farmer said to me one day, Kevin, I don't need the stakes here to identify which alfalfa is which. I can tell you right now. I said, okay, show me. And, it, and you can see on the left-hand side, uh, we had, had both the Alpharex as well as the Pioneer. And you can see the difference in the structure. Former UW forage agronomist Dan Undersander shared that when we have an alfalfa plant, if you harvest just the leaves, we're going to test about 450 relative forage quality. That leaves the stem, which is about 80 relative forage quality. Well, how do we get to 160, 180, 200? It's the leaf stem ratio. And here you can see that comparing the alfalfas that are uh, shown there, there are observable differences. Instead of talking relative forage quality, let's talk what people are after, milk per ton. Again, let's drop to that third and fourth week. You can see approximately a 200 pound milk per ton difference in the two alfalfa varieties being compared both in week three and week four. As well as in this example, again, on the Eastern side of the county, not 200, closer to approximately 100, but there was a difference. And again, I think what we're looking for when we select alfalfas is something that's going to be forgiving to us if we can't harvest it always at the ideal time. When we do research, we try and isolate one variable and keep everything else constant. This is a field from the Alfalfa Yield and Persistence Project. If you quickly go across the top, you can see we have 2019 and 2020. The harvest dates, nearly identical, June 4th, June 6th, July 10th, July 11th, August 2nd, August 5th, September 10th, September 6th. When you look at the far right-hand side, this is a field that survived the winter kill. The growing conditions in Wisconsin in 2019 versus 2020 were so much improved that as we make our way down the far right-hand column, you can see our dry matter content, nearly identical. We saw a 1.8 point improvement in protein. We saw a slight reduction, almost three quarters of a point in ADF. We saw an increase in NDF. So we had more fiber there, but the good news is, look at our NDF digestibility. That increased significantly. And last but not least, that resulted in our relative forage quality um, 
being improved substantially as well. Cost is still a consideration. It did come in at number four. And all I would say here is that there are spreadsheets available. Reach out to your university extension in your state. Here we have an example from Wisconsin. Rather than going through each of the items, let's drop down to the lower right-hand corner. Everybody knows this. When you put alfalfa in the ground in that new seeding year, very hard to recoup all the costs. Mother Nature is going to have a lot to do as far as what yield you have available to you. So while cost is a factor, and in this case I used $8 a pound, it's important to uh, know that one of the comments I received is from all the groups was that farmers were willing to spend a little more on alfalfa than they were corn because of the perennial nature identified throughout. So lastly, in closing, uh, this is a quote that's uh, borrowed. Remember, your nutritionist is only as good as your forage. We can have the best seed, the best pest control. We can do all of these things to have, have killer alfalfa. But if we're not managing it the way we're supposed to, I would, be, I would challenge someone to find alfalfa that could overcome the milk per ton numbers that we're going to see from this forage. Thank you for, for having me today. Thanks, Kevin, and I'd invite Don and Drew and Mitch to rejoin us here as we take the questions from our uh, viewers here. And as a reminder to our viewers here, we're gonna do about 20 minutes of Q&A here and go ahead and type those into the GoToWebinar control panel. I can tell you we've gotten a dozen questions in already here. And I, um, I'm gonna put our team on the spot here, probably led by Don. If we don't get through all the questions, Don, I'm certain that you guys would uh, answer some of these offline in, in uh, email fashion as well. Would that be all right? Yes. Yep, okay. So I'm gonna merge two questions in together here. And one of them, uh, they, they kind of go like this. What type of alfalfa genetics do you recommend for a very aggressive cutting schedules? And you know, I'm, we're talking about like think 24 day or you know, uh, that's certainly aggressive. And another viewer uh, re sent in here, you know, uh, some of the seed today is made from better, uh, the low cost seed, excuse me, is made from uh, quote unquote better genetics from 15 years ago. But how to you talk through with customers to balance uh, the better genetics available today uh, and the return on that and then these aggressive cutting schedules. So I maybe we'll start that one with Donald and then we'll flip it over to uh, Drew up in upstate New York. Don, you want to take that one first? Yeah, the alfalfa breeders have uh, selected some varieties that have fast recovery, and and so if you're looking at uh, a really a short cutting schedule, uh, there are varieties out there in genetics that are available, and so uh, you know our company has one called high ton varieties, and again, uh, just fast recovery, and so uh, they get more leaves up there in a hurry, and so if you're on that aggressive cutting schedule, uh, there are some genetics available. Drew, how about you? Yeah, I, I use uh, product guides just to see if uh, aggressive schedules are are the primary concern, and in this case it is, and just look for the regrowth rate, and that helps me understand if we're gonna get our tonnage back very quickly in order to push a cutting schedule up a few days like that. Mitch, what are you seeing in Indiana, Ohio? About the same thing with Drew. Look at the sheets and kind of focus, you know, the higher the fall dormancy number, the further you can push things, but focus on that winter survival and fast regrowth is the key. In order to get that alfalfa to push your cuttings, you need to have that fast regrowth. Kevin, and I know some of the names of those farms you were talking about in your presentation, and they're pretty aggressive. I know where their alfalfa is going. What, what are you hearing there in your uh, region of the world? Yeah, I mean, we, we we looked at cutting intervals of 30, 35 days years ago. We've got uh, people doing it in 20, and that's what uh, Mother Nature has. I guess I would just um, say that make sure that your fertility is extremely high. You're taking care of um, those plants as far as if they're going to be under that intensive management. Again, I shared some data as far as some differences that that we saw. So uh, selecting an alfalfa um, that's that's going to uh, yield well as well as uh, handle that uh, traffic that's going over the top of it uh, would be important. 
we're going to ask this next question in two stages here. And I know um, on our on our farm that we plant some straight alfalfa, but there's some other fields that either drain, drain quite well or just got some topography issues. And we do uh, put some grass in some of those uh, seeding areas. So what the question is, what would be a good recommendation for alfalfa grass mix? More specifically, what's the best ratio of alfalfa to grass to use in a field? And I'm certain that that probably changes whether you're feeding milk lactating cows, or beef cows, or maybe even the horse market. Don, you have, uh, you've been dealing with that quite a bit over your years here with Alflorex. What, how do you begin unraveling that question? Well, I think, you know, sort of depends on the customer, but uh, orchard grass is, is a pretty good grass to combine with alfalfa. But I think I'll defer to the other guys. Uh, they probably encountered it a little bit more than I do, but uh, see what their opinion is. Mitch, why don't we turn to you first? Yeah, with orchard grass, I mean, we're obviously using five to 10 pounds of orchard grass in a mix. It uh, goes back to sort of what kind of livestock animal you're going to be feeding it for and what kind of grass you're actually going to incorporate in there. But you can push things a little on both spectrums depending on what type of grass seed. And I think that's what you need to understand first is what kind of grass are you going to mix with your alfalfa? Kevin? So this ties into the forage councils. In 2009, we had a uh, farmer plant 15 pounds of alfalfa with uh, four pounds of a Coratol fescue and the stand was dominant alfalfa. You could not find the grass. The conditions were, were drier and cooler. In 2010, we did the same thing. Four pounds alfalfa, or excuse me, four pounds of uh, Coratol fescue, 15 of alfalfa. You could not find the alfalfa. The difference is we had three inches of rain followed by six inches of rain followed by. So mother, the hard thing for farmers, and, and uh, I've asked others about this and they've observed the same thing. You can pick a, ratio of seed and alfalfa that you want, but the growing conditions during establishment are gonna favor one of those two, two items. So that may displace uh, what you originally thought. I think that uh, if we, we can have 60, 70% uh, legumes in the stand, obviously that's gonna help the grasses because of the nitrogen fixation. Um, we're using some improved tall fescue varieties in that in those lower spots that would fill in. Farmers like the fact that they're not driving over dandelions or empty spots when, when that's incorporated into the mix. Drew, how are you tackling that uh, in New York? I can tell you what, it seems like uh, Kevin's about the same spot as me because uh, I like core tall fescue uh, about 30% and then 70% my alfalfa. So at 20 pounds, we're talking about the same thing there. But what I've done in addition is I've had guys sub out meadow fescue. We've had good results out here with that. Uh, it's a variety that's a little less aggressive and we're able to have success and pick up a little bit of quality by doing that too. So the follow-up question to that is, uh, so sometimes you wanna extend alfalfa uh, stand life and what are you recommending if you have to come in and add some uh, some grass to an existing stand. Uh, Drew, why don't you take that one first? Uh, exactly what you said. Uh, we can we can add uh, tall fescue, metal fescue sometimes, or even we can uh, drill in Italian ryegrass to get some quick regrowth there to help extend the stand for a year or two. So those, those are some of the options guys are trying. Mitch? Yeah, I think the key that Drew hit on there is whether you're going to be taking it for one year. You know, a lot of times if you're on the third year of the alfalfa, you can determine if you're going to use an annual or a perennial to really kind of push for the grasses that you'll put in there. So sort of understand what guys are going to be shooting for, how thin their alfalfa field is. Those are all key, very important questions. But the tall fescues, the Italian rye grasses, they, they work well in our zone. Kevin? Lots of Italian ryegrass was used uh, to help nurse along our alfalfa stands. And I, I did this for the first time in 2005 with a farmer and we couldn't believe the NDF digestibility as long as you manage that grass as a part of that alfalfa stand correctly. So they can coexist. I agree with both Mitch's and Drew's comments. 
We're going to turn this question over to Drew and Mitch here. And I know you're not from uh, Minnesota here. There's a number of questions coming in very specific to different uh, growers here. But the question is going to be, any chance Hygest 460 will perform well in southeast Minnesota? But I'm going to add to it. So that's the question. I've had some customers using Hygest 360 since it was introduced a few years ago. What is new with the FD3 in WS 1.5? And the question again is, any chance Hygest 460 will perform in south, well, in southeast Minnesota? A lot of the same growing conditions that are in your areas. Drew? For me, in my area, that really depends on elevation and soil type. Uh, both can be used here, but uh, I've got guys that have used uh, the 460 maybe on too high of an elevation, and we didn't get the fall dormancy early enough, and I, I, don't, I don't think it, it stayed around as well as it should have. So that's the big consideration for me in my area is matching soil type and elevation to make sure it's the right fit for the guys. But the people that have uh, lower lying land and warmer warmer temperatures up to five degrees, uh, they use that, they use a 460. Mitch? Yeah, I mean, just kind of going back with what Drew said, our, our high low lignin alfalfa, our 360, that seems to be one of our flagship models we've got the 460 used through here but understanding the soil type and exactly where it's going to be at um, again I'm from Ohio here so we're talking you know different parts of the country but would definitely think that with some of the newer genetics that they can be pushed a little bit further than what they've been able to do in the past. So Kevin we're going to change uh, questions here and uh, we, we're going to try to get as many answered here in the next 10 minutes. If you planted a leaf hopper resistant variety, and you would you still have to spray if uh, leaf hoppers were in, in, in the area? The answer is yes. And this actually came up. I, I neglected to say the fifth item uh, was leaf hopper resistance, glyphosate tolerance, uh, multi leaf uh, compatibility with grasses. Those all came after the four characteristics I identified. And I think one of the the uh, concerns was that it's resistant. It's not leaf hopper proof, it's resistant. And so there's still a responsibility for the producers to scout, manage those thre thresholds and spray if necessary. Donald, this next question's coming to you. And I, uh, there's regions, uh, regions out West that uh, obviously irrigate a lot of alfalfa, but then there's other parts, particularly in California, that uh, water availability is an issue especially um, where it's gonna be allocated. So the question is this, uh, does variety selection change if you have very limited water in the case of dry land farms in the West? Don? Well, what we're seeing is that a, a good variety is a good variety. And uh, you know the management of, uh, of that variety may differ if, depending on how much water you have. And, but uh, we are seeing that uh, if you have a good variety with good genetics, and, and maybe out west, even a salt tolerant variety uh, can uh, give you an advantage under those limited water conditions. But uh, uh, what we're looking at is uh, there's a lot of breeding uh, currently being looked at is trying to improve the drought tolerance of alfalfa or, or maybe the less than optimal moisture uh, situation. So maybe not just shutting the water off completely, but uh, can we get uh, a comparable production with a little bit less water or how we uh, actually apply that water during the season? Do we apply the water early in the season and then let uh, it go uh, drought induced dormancy during the middle of the summer. So there are some genetics out there, but if you do have a good variety, uh, it tends to do uh, well under limited irrigation also. So Don, I'm gonna stick with you on this next question here. And I think, you know, everybody is on a different learning curve here. Um, on our farm, my dad uh, tended to handle the crops a lot more and I did the, uh, animals more so and he's no longer with us so i'm even going to learn a little bit here on this one in the alfalfa rating chart they are rated on fd what is the vl rating listed and they're listed vl two to six so talk through those acronyms a little bit and and bring everybody up to speed on that question so say, say that again the fall dormancy and and, and the vl rating fall dormancy is fd and then Maybe the viewer didn't uh, type this in right. They use the initials VL, but their VL is rated two to six. Maybe they're just simply talking about fall dormancy. I'm not sure what that, that rating is. Um, 
I'm not, not quite hearing that right, I guess, but uh, uh, fall dormancy and winter survival rating. Um, uh, you know, fall dormancy is one to 10, uh, lower the number of uh, more winter survival you have. Uh, you know, and winter survival rating, uh, the lower the number, we want two or lower on that, so. Okay, we'll go with that. Drew and Mitch, um, have you dealt with uh, coated versus uncoated seeds in, in, in the field? What's your opinion there, uh, Mitch? Yeah, so with coated seeds, uh, I would totally recommend it. When we actually tried some trials where we've actually had coated and non-coated, our stand counts, even though you are seeding less seeds per acre with coated, your actually germination, your success rate, the actual stand count was better than the non trued So a lot less seeds per pound, you know, as far as the seed count goes. And that's why some guys will venture to say, I'm getting a better value by me buying more seeds, but the coating under certain weather and certain circumstances can make a big difference on your success. Drew, what's your take? I, I feel the same way. Mother nature often wins. And when we can use a coated seed, uh, it helps prevent her from winning and destroying us. So I prefer coated seeds. It just gives us a little protection with the unknowns. Kevin, I know you spend a lot of time uh, working through alfalfa issues there. And, and, and I think Don, during his presentation, pointed out the nice variety selection chart from uh, NAFA. But a question that uh, one of the viewers put in here, is there a variety search program where I can put in my zip code and target uh, my farm and get the varieties from my area? Is there anything like that? Or does Alflorex offer anything like that? I'll, first one, we'll go to Kevin and I'll pop that back over to Don. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we, we're in a transition here with the uh, University of uh, Wisconsin Division of Extension. And so um, I'm sorry, we don't have a tool that would be that specific. Um, no, we don't have a search engine uh, at this time, maybe in the future, but uh, we do have uh, product guides that are geared for different parts of the country, the Western US or, or the Eastern or the upper Midwest, but uh, no uh, online uh, computer search engine. Don, I think I'm going to stick here with you on this question because you'll, you know, uh, you might be able to best answer this. Uh, this person is in Kentucky and he sells to the thoroughbred racehorse uh, market and he wanted, he needs leafy fine stemmed alfalfa suitable for those, uh, th those animals. What would you recommend there? Well, you know, our, our new, um, you know, the high gest materials, it's, uh, we've improved the leaf to stem ratio. And so if they want something that's very leafy and, and uh, uh, good fiber digestibility, that, that whole uh, set of genetics is pretty good. Kevin, we're going to come over to you on this one because this uh, is going to bring in herbicides. He, uh, this grower here is dealing with uh, seed blown from foxtails along the roadway. Of course, roadways and na neighbors' fields never uh, impact the new seeding. I'm saying that tongue in cheek, of course. Um, and he's planting straight alfalfa. What herbicide selection, or what, what would be his approach to get rid of that foxtail? So here's what I'm gonna say, just because uh, there, this could be a longer answer. We do have a publication, um, A3646 Pest Management in Wisconsin. We do have a section on alfalfa, and we have ratings for each of the different weeds uh, that you would be controlling in those establishment situations. So rather than looking at the short time we have here, I would say we do have a publication. If you Google what I said, uh, you will find a resource. If you don't reach out to me. Why don't you repeat that one more time so they can jot it down, Kevin? Apologies for the fast talking. Um, it's A3646, Pest Management in Wisconsin Field Crops. And it's a downloadable PDF and it covers all the crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa. And in that publication, there is a chart showing a ranking of the herbicides and how they will do against any particular weed. Drew, we're gonna kick this question to you and Mitch next. And if Don wants to add, he can certainly do that. I'm gonna set up the question here, but um, so this is coming from a West Texas dairyman. And he's asking, uh, they use a lot of dormancy nine alfalfa. What do you think about mixing varieties of eight and nine dormancy together in the same field? So he's talking about hedging his risk, risk mitigation here. 
So this question could apply to Texas, Minnesota, New York. What do you think about planting two alfalfa varieties with different dormancies in the same field? That's really the question. <laughs> I know you're smiling there already, Drew. Go ahead. Uh, I don't I don't know if there's that much to gain in my world on that. I, I don't know if I would risk half my stand having a high probability of winter kill if I was really uh, stepping outside of my zone. Um, but if there were two varieties right in this, that in my area choosing between a three and a four dormancy, I could do that. But if it was be choosing between a four or a four and a five or a five and a six, I just go with my lowest one and stick with that. But if they're just one apart, I can see them doing that. I, I don't know the big gain, but. Mitch? So I think he's you know trying to focus on risk management there. Do you split your risk by planting two different hybrids in the event that maybe one has better winter survival rating? One maybe is a fall dormancy five compared to a four. Threes and fours, we get up into the fives a little bit in our area. Um, would it be worth it? And is it you know a good recommended practice? I think that could be both ways there. Uh, we have mixed some alfalfas here, but really can't sit there and say that we've seen a significant advantage and would feel that we would want people to mix the alfalfas. It's a risk management tool that I think it's per an individual and what he feels comfortable and uncomfortable doing. Don, you probably get that question a lot over the years. What's your thoughts? Well, I think the first question is going to be is um, how do you manage the, the cutting of that? Because if you're planning a fall dormancy nine, it's going to flower first. Uh, even during the middle of the summer, you're going to see uh, few days difference between a nine and an eight and so how do you um, harvest that field is, is it going to be past maturity or uh, again you're going to get uh, the two different varieties uh, flowering at different times and and also coming back a little bit uh, different uh, on the regrowth so uh, again I don't know how much of an advantage uh, that would be uh, maybe in some cases a disadvantage so to get pick a good variety that has has uh, what you need and and go with it I would agree with the peak stick, you're looking for a uniform stamp. Good advice there, Kevin. As a reminder, we're at the top of the hour now here, and I, all of our uh, viewers are going to receive a survey at the conclusion of the webinar. And we'd ask that you take that. We learn a lot from that. We uh, tweak our webinars, and uh, as presenters, we all learn a great deal. I'd like to remind everyone viewing that our to put on your calendar January 7th, 2021, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, we will present quality parameters in forage quality. Our panelists will bring back Don Miller with Alflorex Seeds and we'll welcome John Gazer to the program. So I would again like to thank our panelists today. I, I thank Don Miller, Drew Heise, Mitch Sadoff, and Kevin Jark for joining us on Alfalfa Livestream. I'm Corey Geiger, your host and MC, and I wish you all a great day. Take care, everyone. Bye.